Hi guys, what's up? Welcome back to this week's video. So today is April 20... April 30th and if you're a fellow bookworm you will know that the Shadow and Bone TV show came out last Friday one week ago um, on Netflix. I watched it with my dad and my sisters, two of my sisters, and we watched five episodes on Friday and two episodes, three episodes on um, Saturday and we loved it. It was amazing. Um, there are some things that I didn't like but we'll get into that in when I'm I'm gonna like review the TV show at some point. Um, but yeah, a week before the TV show, so two weeks ago today, I did a kind of a book report slash presentation about the Shadow and Bone series for my family. And I had a script and I had slides. I suddenly thought, oh, you know what? I could do this and post it on YouTube. So that's what I'm going to do. This is going to be kind of um, like a bit of a... There are no spoilers. It's kind of a book report. There are no spoilers. Um, this is completely spoiler free. Um, there is a run through of chap of kind of I think it's like chapters one through six maybe. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I'm just gonna get straight into the video. I'm not gonna be on the video. You're just gonna see the slides, but you'll hear my voice over the top of it. So yeah, let's get straight into the Hi. video. Hi. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about one of my favourite YA fantasy series, the Shadow and Bone trilogy. Now these books take place in the Grishaverse. This map shows you the entire world, but for this presentation, we're just going to focus on this map. So this book takes place mainly in the country of Ravka, which is splat bang in the middle of the ice country of Fjorda and the mountain country of the Shuhan. But you don't need to know much about those countries apart from the fact that Ravka has been at war with those countries for many many years. But I'll get to that later. Now Ravka is split in half by a sea of blackness which is called the Unsea or the Shadowfold. It was created by a man named the Black Heretic thousands of years ago. The capital of Ravka is Oas Alta. You also have Karmazin, which is a small town on the edge of the fold. Now, Ravka has two armies. You've got the first army, and then you've got the second army. Now, who are the first army? The first army is a group of people. Um, they are completely comprised of non-Grisha members. Some join voluntarily, and some get conscripted. Who do the First Army fight for? The First Army fight for their king, Alexander Lantzov III, and of course, for Ravka. The Second Army. What is the Second Army? The Second Army is a group of people called Grisha. They are completely comprised of, of Grisha, and in fact, you can't join unless you are Grisha. What are Grisha? Grisha are a group of people with the ability to manipulate matter. They usually discover this ability at a young age and are brought to the little palace in Oas Alta where, they all, where all the Grisha live and they're taught how to use their power. Now Grisha value status and power. They like to think of themselves as better than each other. They're also split into three different groups. Here's a simple way of, to break them down from most feared to least feared. You have the Corporalki, the Order of the Living Dead. Now the Corporalki again are split into three factions. You have the heart renders, who have the ability to snatch air from your lungs or slow your pulse until you drop into a coma or even crush your heart in your chest. And they can do this all without even touching you. Then you have healers and they're literally the opposite of the heart renders. It's their job to keep people well and safe and alive. And unlike the heart renders who are usually on the front lines fighting, they're usually kept a little away from the battle. They're kept away and they have soldiers, wounded soldiers or wounded Grisha brought to them and they'll heal them so that they can keep fighting. And then you have tailors. Tailors have the ability to change their appearance and the appearance of others. And depending on how talented they are, they can sometimes change that appearance permanently. Then you have the next Grisha order, the Ethereal-Ki, the order of summoners. And again, the Ethereal-Ki is split into three groups. You have the Inferni, 
while they cannot create fire, they can manipulate combustible gases, such as methane or hydrogen. However, they still need a flint to start a spark. Then you have squalors. They can lower and raise the air pressure to create storms. Then you have tide makers, and they use the temperature and pressure to control and summon water. Then you've got the last Grisha order, the materialki, the order of fabricators. Now, the materialki are the lab geeks of the Grisha, and even though they're the least respected, they are becoming more valuable every day because of the war. You have the Jurast, who deal with solids such as Grisha steel, core cloth, which is similar to modern body armour, textiles and glass. Then you have the Alchemy, and they specialise in poisons and blasting powder. Now, Grisha are very easy to pick out of a crowd due to their clothes. Grisha wear things called kefters, and they each have their own colour. The Corporalki wear crimson kefters, the Etherealki wear blue kefters, and the Materialki wear purple kefters. You also have Grisha that work at the Royal Palace, where the Lansoff family live, and they wear white kefters with gold embroidery. You do, however, have certain Grishas that wear other colours, such as the Darkling, who I'll talk about in a moment, who only wears black. And then you have Alina, our protagonist, who wears a few different coloured kefters. She wears a gold one, a black one, and a blue one, for instance. Now, I'd like to tell you about some of the characters. First, we've got Alina Starkov. Alina was orphaned at a very young age and grew up in an orphanage in Karamazin with her best friend Mal. Both of them had very few friends, so they had a very solitary childhood. Alina was conscripted into the First Army at the age of 16 as an assistant cartographer. She's made a few friends among her fellow cartographers. One such is called Alexis. And even though she grew up pretty close to the fold, she's never been in it. But her regiment is about to make their first trip into the fold. And most people that go in never come out. Then you've got Malian Oretsev, or Mal. So as I said, Mal grew up in an orphanage in Karamazin with Alina, so he also had a very lonely childhood. But he did show promise as a tracker at a young age, so he accompanied the men on lots of hunting trips. He was also conscripted, but at the age of 17, as a tracker and has grown to be one of, if not the best tracker in the First Army. And even though Alina has a long-standing crush on Mal, he only sees her as a baby sister and constantly flirts with other people. Then you've got the Darkling. The Darkling is the leader and the most powerful of the Grisha. He is very trusted by the king, and he is the only Grisha to ever wear a black kafta. But he is not the first Darkling. There have been many Darklings throughout Ravka's history. And like all the other Darklings, he is a descendant of the Black Heretic, the creator of the Fold. And because of that, he feels like he has a certain weight on, that hangs on his shoulders to destroy what his ancestor created. And he believes that the legendary Sun Summoner will be able to help him destroy the Fold. Next up, we have Janya. Janya is a very gifted tailor, and because of that, she was given by the Darkling to the Queen as a gift. She works for the Queen and doesn't wear the crimson kefta of a tailor, but a white kefta with golden embroidery. Janya was left at the little palace as a young girl and therefore grew up training with her tailoring ability and growing up around a lot of other Grisha. And because she works for the Queen and there are rumours about Janya and the King, she is resented by a lot of the other Grisha, which is why Alina becoming friends with her was such a sweet gesture. And lastly, is my personal favourite Grishaverse character, Zoya. Zoya is a squalor, and she's one of, possibly the best. And as a squalor, she can summon and control st strong gusts of wind, her favourite being a lightning storm. Zoya is very trusted by the Darkling, and until he meets Alina, she was his most favourite Grisha. So she kind of resents Alina because of that. And lastly, Zoya has a very, and I mean very, strong temper. She doesn't get along with many of the other Grisha, and she is a complete loner. And now I think about it, I should probably tell you about these guys. This is a Volcra. What is a Volcra? Volcra are the beasts that live in the fold. Alina describes her look at one of them as horrifying. She says that it was a big winged beast with white eyes and boned hands and feet, and that it was completely grey. What created them? The fold, and therefore the black heretic. 
When the black heretic created the fold, that's what created them. That's where they live. They don't like the light and they feast on human flesh. Now, what kickstarts the story? Well, that would be Alina's first trip into the fold. We meet Alina the day before she goes into the fold. She's speaking with Mal when three carriages roll past. One is red, one is black, and one is blue. They know that the black carriage is the Darkling's carriage because his personal guards are riding up front with the driver, which means that the red carriage must be full of corporal key and the blue one full of ethereal key. Now, nothing happens with Grisha and everyone goes about their day, but the next morning they all board the skiff like planned and with the squalor's help, they enter the fold. Now, they haven't been in the fold long when the Volcra attack. The Grisha fight back, but even with the fire and the winds, the, the Volcra managed to kill many, including Alina's friend Alexis. They managed to injure Mal, and he is dying, and Alina is by his side. He says something to her, and as he does, Alina feels a Volcra sink its talons into her shoulder. The world goes white, she feels the Volcra let her go, and she blacks out. Now, I think it's a few days later when she wakes up and is taken to the Grisha's tent, where she meets the Darkling. A lot of talking happens, people coming in and telling what they saw, all saying the same thing. There was an attack and then a sudden blinding light. And it is while this is happening that we see Mal, and even though he is very wounded, he is alive. After everything has been said, we discover that Alina is in fact the Sun Summoner, and the Darkling gives the order for her to be taken to the little palace. So without giving time for a goodbye, she's bundled into a carriage and taken to Oas Alta. And that is where our story begins. Now there is the question, how did Lee Bardugo come up with the idea for these books? Lee said in an interview that the idea for the Grishava started with the Shadow Fold. She said she was staying at friends in the country and was alone for the night when she fell asleep. And when she woke up, it was pitch black. Now, Leah's a city girl, so she'd never seen Country Black before. She was fumbling around for a switch when she heard someone breathing. She convinced herself that she wasn't alone, and it was only when she pulled her shoe off to defend herself that she realised it was her breathing and she'd scared herself. But then she began to wonder, well, what if the darkness was a place? What if you couldn't just flip on a light? And that was how she created the fold. She then began to wonder, well, what would live there, and came up with the Volcra. She said that she just kept asking herself question after question until she got out of bed and just sat down and wrote. Now, I love these books, don't get me wrong, but there are just a few things that I don't particularly like. The Mal, Alina, Darkling, Nikolai love thing. I don't hate love triangles, but this just made me laugh. In my opinion, Nikolai, who you meet in book two, doesn't need to love Alina. Her relationship with the Darkling grows and becomes a toxic love. Mal, in my personal opinion, is the only love interest needed. The middle of the second book, to me, feels a little slow. The second book starts and ends brilliantly, but the middle of it felt like it was lacking something. I don't know what. I just remember finding it a little hard to read and the only thing that kept me going was that I loved Alina and I had to know how her story ended. And lastly, the Grisha orders are very complicated. Especially if you're new to the books, the orders are hard to wrap your head around. And even now, after reading the books thousands of times, I still struggle to understand what's what. But like there are things that I don't like, there are things that I love. The believable and relatable characters. When I read a book, I want and need the characters to be believable. I want to be able to relate to them because I feel like I have something in common with the character then. And when you're reading Alina's story, you feel her pain, her love, her sadness and hatred, and you can identify with what she's doing. She's doing what she feels right, which if you think about it, is all we ever do. The villain's scary. If the book I'm reading has a villain that I've been told is scary and a good villain, but is actually just a soft and cuddly guy, then what's the point of having the villain? In my opinion, the villain in the Grishaverse is almost as scary as Voldemort. The plot never stops. When you pick up a fantasy book, you want the plot to be good, because if it isn't, it's harder to enjoy reading it. 
You want the plot to grasp your attention and not let you go. And these books do that so well. Whenever you think you know what's coming, a curveball of a plot twist comes out of nowhere. And I think that's one of the reasons why they're so well loved. Now, I'd like to tell you three of my favourite quotes and what they mean to me. You and I are going to change the world. This is something the Darkling says to Alina when they're at the Little Palace. And if you think about it, this could apply to any of us. Because every single decision we make changes the world. So if we make good decisions, then we could change the world for the better. I am not ruined, I am ruination. Now, if you remember the first picture of Jenya, you can see that she looks very differently here. She has a lot more scars and she's missing an eye. Now, Jenya goes through a lot in these books, things that no one should have to go through. And because of these scars, she gets called Razrushaya, which is Ravkin for the ruined. But by the end of the last book, she tells people, don't call me that, saying, I am not ruined, I am ruination. We all have scars, both mental and physical, and sometimes we let those scars tell us that we're ruined, but we're not. Don't let your scars overpower you. You're not ruined. And lastly, we have no mourners, no funerals. This is actually a quote from Six of Crows, which is the second series in the Grishaverse. And it's what the crows say to each other. They say that it's like their way of saying good luck. Now, I don't have a reason for th loving this quote. It's just an amazing quote and I want it out on the list. I'd like to finish with three reasons why I think you should read these books. It's amazingly written. Every chapter is a cliffhanger and you never want to put it down. I think it's because of that that I love it so much. In these books, we meet characters who stand on their own. But when they finally start to let people in and let them help them, they get their job done better than they could have on their own. And I think these books tell us that we're always going to work better as a team. And lastly... I don't know about you, but a good book has to have some amazing characters. And again, if the characters aren't good and believable, then personally, I can't read it. And I know she's not here, and she probably will never watch this, but I want to say thank you to Lee Bardugo for writing these seven incredible books. They've changed my life, and I will treasure them forever. And thank you for listening to me rant about these books. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope you will give them a go. They're definitely worth it.